Uh, and <laughs> I guess at this point it really doesn't make a difference. I mean, we come to the conclusion snap here means fins and cascasset means scale uh, scales, and I guess that's the that's the convention that we should understand. But I guess from the pure Talmudic logic, you have two words and you have fins and scales. I guess you could logically argue that cascasset could mean the fin and snapir could mean the scales. But you know, then the Mishnah would have been written koshiyishlo snapir yishlo <laughs> cascasset. I mean, so it doesn't you know it doesn't provide a problem you know which one's which. It's just that the Mishnah would have been written differently. All right. So then the Talmud asks another question. Vahashta the cut of Rahman is not here because Kasset. And now that the that the merciful one writes Snapir Vikas Kasset, Minal and the Kaskaset Labushahu. So how do you know that Kaskaset is something that one wears? In other words, like the, the scales of the fish. Dikhtiv, as it's written in the book of Samuel one. And I think that it is, yes, 17.5 in Samuel 1, it says, Hishiryon kas kasim hulavush, that Goliath, Goliath, was wearing, uh, they used to call it, I think, a suit of mail, in which, I mean, the mail was these little pieces of metal. Shiryon, shiryon means armor, kaskasim, an armor of kaskasim he was wearing. So then, so then the Kumara asks, the lichtov rachamana kaskeset voloboy snapir. So now, now that we know from um, Shmuel Aleph that kaskeset means scales, so then why write snapir? Amarabi abahu. Rabbi Abahuans, and by the way, Tosfos points out that um, uh, it's re really there's there had to be some type of tradition or Masorah that Kaskeset meant scales because what would have the Torah meant before Shmuel was written? Okay, but I it put that to the side. Amar Rabbi Abahu v'chaytan in the Bay Rabbi Shmuel. So Rabbi Abahu says, and also we learn in the Bay Rabbi in the Bay Rabbi Shmuel, Yagdil Torah v'yadir. Sometimes the Torah writes unnecessary things in order to yagdil, to amplify the Torah, the adir, and to, and to beautify it. I found an inter interesting explanation in Rabbi Natan Slifkin's book, uh, Sacred Monsters, I think, uh, which he discusses the concept of unusual types of things, you know, things that Chazal reported on that possibly even they didn't knew that didn't even exist. The concept of, of, of Yagdil Torah Yadir could mean that the Torah does want us to consider uh, scarce or unusual or rare or logically impossible types of things because when we train our minds to think about the impossible or to think about the unusual, it gives us a better understanding or a better ability to apply uh, to apply the halacha to and whenever t any time that we find something which is uh, unusual. So it's a good habit. The concept of yagdil torah yadir isn't just a it's not just a, uh, a nice concept, you know, to puff up the Torah. It's actually a very practical concept that, that we as Jews should be in the habit of um, uh, toying with concepts or in, in, uh, in engaging concepts that at first glance appear to be impossible. Uh, and you know that, uh, you know, a lot of the study of cosmology and physics and uh, you know, it comes from physicists thinking out of the box, coming up with models and theories that have even have either have been rejected in the past or haven't been thought about in the past. So um, uh, the concept of Yagdil Torah Yadir is an imperative to us to try and think out of the box. Okay, I think that's a very nice idea, and uh, maybe I'll throw an extra credit on that. Okay, uh, so here we have a rule from the Mishnah 
that says anything which has scales also has fins. Uh, scientifically, uh, is is that true? I mean, if Chazal say it, you know, generally the first pan answer is is that yeah, well then it's you know it's got to be true. It just it always begs the concept is that any time you put some type of sweeping rule like that. You know, and then you find an exception, uh, like the Ma'adane Yontov says, that there was some type of scientist who produced a, screech, a creature who brought a creature with scales and legs, uh, and this uh, seems to contradict the Mishnah because it uh, it didn't have fins. So um, there are a number of uh, answers. Uh, that are offered, and there, and there, and if you find, if you take a look in the Aruch Hashulchan, uh, that's a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, the Jewish law book, in section uh, Samach Gimel, 83. If you take a look, Aruch Hashulchan was written by Rabbi Yechiel Michal Epstein, and he uh, brings up this question and uh, lists out the answers. Like, for example, one answer was is that, well, the legs were in the place of the fin, so it really did have a fin, just it didn't look like a fin, it was actually a leg. Or a second answer was that the uh, the fins had fallen off once it was taken out of the water. A third answer is that of known of the Kareti Upleti, um, which is uh, a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch. And the Kareti Upleti uh, states that the Mishnah only speaks about the majority of cases. <coughs> that uh, when Chazal used to give rules, you don't necessarily have to consider that as a uh, as an all-inclusive rule. Now, there are many who take uh, take issue with the Kreti Upleti and say that the discussion of the Gemara seems to imply, you know, why did it say this and why did it say that? The discussion of the Gemara seems to imply that it was a rule without exceptions. But that does not scare off the Kreti Upleti, say that sometimes, you know, Talmudic discussions go with that line of thinking, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean in essence that uh, it was a rule without exceptions. Uh, and another answer could possibly be is that the whole rule of fins and scales only applies to fish-like creatures, not all creatures. In other words, fish-like creatures are creatures that are like oval like this and have a tail at the end and eyes at the front and old mouth and you know that's like a fish like that's that's called Doug. I knew a guy named Doug. All right, in any case. Uh, you had to have that joke. I mean, that 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 was that joke was bound to show up at some point. In any case, uh, Rav Epstein in the Aruch Shulchan on the section of Shulchan Aruch called Yoradea uh, brings up this question. Uh, and at first glance, uh, as I said before, it appears that such is the case. Uh, also, there is a Gemara from. Uh, from the Sechet of Oda Zara, page 39, which talks about different animals of the sea. Say, which one is kosher? You know, Hamra de Yama is kosher, and there's some other uh, animal, uh, de Yama. So it, it appears from the use, uh, from the terminology, because the Gemara it mentions Hamra, the, the donkey. I forgot to say this before. The Hamara means donkey, the donkey of the sea. So the implication is, is that whatever the creature is, it looks like some type of donkey. Uh, I don't think he's talking about a seahorse. Who knows? I don't really know. But whatever the case is, if you have a discussion as to whether the donkey of the sea is kosher and that some other type of animal sea is not kosher, it appears that the rule of Slavir Vikaskes it applies both to fish shaped types of uh, things and also non fish shaped types of things. <coughs> However, the Rambam makes a very clear distinction between Surat Hadag, the form of the fish, things that look like fish, versus all other sea creatures and animals. Now, according to the Rambam, the fins and scales rules only applies to things that look like fish. But all other creatures are forbidden, even if they have scales. Um, 
and uh, I guess they could have, you know, you do have other types of creatures that might have fins, but I don't know. I mean, when I think of lobsters, I don't think of fins. When I think of a mollusk, I don't think of fins. But in any case, uh, Rav Epstein's uh, reading of the text uh, actually supports the Rambam. Let's go back to the text on the first page for a second. It reads as follows. Uh, you may eat this from anything which is water. Okay, anything which has fins and scales. And there's anything which doesn't have fins and scales, you know, uh, you you can't eat. Now, but it has this terminology in the pasuk. Mikol sheretz hamayim, or mikol nefesh hachaya asher b'mayim. From anything that swarms in the water and any living beast which is in the water, shekets heimochem. So, if that is a descriptor from all that swarms in water, in other words, is the Torah saying from anything that swarms in water and all living beasts in water, this rule applies, fins and scales. If it's there you may eat it, if it's not there you may not eat it. In which case this descriptor of Mikol Sheretz HaMaim, Mikol Nefesh HaChayash should have also been written on the first verse. It should have been written as follows. Kol Asher Lo Snabir Bekaskeset Bamaim Bayamim Uvan Cholim Mikol Sheretz HaMaim, Mikol Nefesh HaChayash HaMaim and then it should have said, in other words, it should have put that descriptor on the verse that talks about what you may eat, and then do it again. And anything which doesn't have fins and scales, as long as you're, as long as you're repeating what uh, what you may not eat, and then you would have the descriptor, and anything that swarms and all beasts in the water. See, it would make uh, semantic sense, logical sense. Anything which has fi uh, which has fins and scales in all its swarms and all beasts in the water, and anything that doesn't have fins and scales of all its swarms and has uh, of, of living beasts in the water, that would make sense. But the Torah wasn't written that way. 